Hello, viewers. Uh, my name is Danny O'Brien, and you're listening, watching, because we've already had this debate about whether a podcast should have a video content and whether that's actually a violation of the terms and services of the very nature of the term podcast. Um, but you're doing whatever you're doing to deweb decoded, uh, which is our regular look here at the Falcon Foundation into the ins and outs and the befores and afters of decentralizing or re decentralizing the web. I am joined today with somebody I'm very excited, though a little kind of a new or two, um, <laughs> Corey Doctorow. So Joe Thorn, Joe, who 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 is the producer of this program, uh, just before I went on, said, "Yeah, I was talking to Corey and getting all his like biographical details, but then he just went." Does, does Danny really need this? Um, and I should for like due diligence and everything. So I'll do the intro. Corey Doctorow is a science fiction author, correct? Correct. Correct. That's Activist what they tell me. Uh, he is the author of many books, most recently The Lost Cause, a solar punk science fiction novel of hope amidst the climate emergency. His most recent nonfiction book is The Internet Con, How to Seize the Means of Computation, a uh, big tech disassembly manual. But here's the thing you should know is that me and Corey go back and we can date this precisely because it was <laughs> I was gonna say it was September the eleventh, uh the 2001. September 11th, 2001, yeah. the actual one, where we met at a very awkward party. Um where we were all like, Well, what do we did anything happen to you? Um uh, and we've sort of, inter our lives have interlaced. Um, it's not nepotism. It's just the nature of the thing. Um, I, I am the your daughter's godfather. You are my daughter's <laughs> godfather. I did take your job at EFF and we crossed over for a little bit. Um, you were writing about me earlier today <laughs> in your, uh, go to pluralistic.net. Corey is, a, um, a, a, uh, um, a very prolific writer, but writes this amazing daily thing. Uh, today he was talking about a thing that, that I did 20 years ago. Did you say? 20 years minus 17 days ago. So 20 years ago, minus 17 days, don't know what when this will be going out. I coined the term life hacking. And the reason why it has become hugely popular is not because I did anything about it, but because Corey wrote about it on Boing Boing, um, which was, you know, big in the 90s. And um uh and uh and actually kind of I'm in your sort of milieu of uh, sort of a, a, where you create these ideas and you pump out these concepts and you, 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 you've been doing this so well with pluralistic recently, which is just sort of framing the present day with an eye to where we're going. Hmm. Um, yeah. and actually, and actually I remember what we were talking about on nine 11, apart from the obvious, which was at the time you were complaining and I was sympathizing about how long it takes to write a book and not the writing bit, but the publishing mm. part of it. Mm -hmm. Is it because basically it was the curse of sort of being a science fiction writer at that point, just post 2000, where you write some brilliant thing and put it into your novel. And then you go in the future, people will jump into cars that are uh, using an app and they won't be taxes they will be just people's normal cars. And then they'd have to wait two years for it to come out. Mm -hmm, and everyone would mm -hmm. go, are you describing Ubers? What? Hmm. Um, has it got shorter? Uh, publishing has just gotten weirder. Uh, so s since, um, I almost said since nine 11, but of course, since the pandemic, <laughs> since the other great the other, rupture the, with history, right. uh, the timelines are either incredibly short or incredibly long. And everything either uh, works like at incredible breakneck speed or there are huge delays. So, for example, the Internet Con published on Labor Day because my British publisher was like, I'm sure it'll be fine promoting your book in America on Labor Day. There's <laughs> there's no reason not to bring it out then. Um, but it became a bestseller and sold out the whole print run by the end of September. But then they couldn't print more until the end of October. 
right. because there are huge supply chain problems and all of the printers are booked well in advance. This is like getting more uh, um, low power silicon for your Toyota, right? And and just having like, a, you know, these cars that people want to buy sitting on the lot that just don't have any chips in them, except it's orders for books that there are no dead trees for. So there's, there's, it's, it's a little bit of everything in terms of like whether the future comes faster. I've gotten a lot less, uh, precious about whether or not I'm writing about the future, you know, whether I'm inventing the future, the, a whole bunch of writers since then, Neil Stevenson, but also particularly William Gibson, uh, with the pattern recognition books did so well commenting on the recent past as though it was the future and really made the point so clearly that what it, what science fiction is is a way of talking about technology and that sometimes involves technological speculation but it isn't speculation itself like right. the the you know in the future you know we will shave the latency of a certain networking process by a certain number of microseconds it, it doesn't matter if you write about that after it's happened, before it's happened, right. if it never happens, you're you're thinking about what what's going to happen if that happens, and how right. it relates to today, right? And also the space of things that can happen and probably won't. Like I think when we were both at EFF, the bit that I found really interesting was you've got this incredibly slow moving thing, which is the 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 gears of law. And you have this relatively fast moving thing that's going to be changing things. And you have to go, okay, where are these two things going to collide in like five years time? Mm -hmm. Like by the time we have like a court decision about spam, where will spam be? And mm -hmm. like, where can we, like, what are the things that we, we, we have to worry about? Like, I remember the first day when we coincided, you wrote on the internal all at EFF.org, a really sterling kind of description of whether um, email addresses were public information or not. Mm. Because people were trying to work out whether it was whether we should obfuscate email addresses on the website because we were getting a lot of spam. Mm -hmm. And it, it, for everybody else, you're just like, oh no, just do it or whatever. But there's like all these things that connect to it. There's like the legal side of it, like you know, email addresses, are they personal identifying information? There's also though that part, like, I think no one shares their email addresses, right? Like no one publicly puts their email addresses up and it's probably just a cultural thing now, right? It's probably that people just don't do it. Mm -hmm. It's also the major social media websites don't want you to put up your email address. Sure. Because then you could just email them and say, you know, not go through the LinkedIn contact page or something like that. And there's all these like little subtleties and changes that go through as people's relationship with technology changes. I should get back onto the general topic. I, I mean, just to put a, a dot on that, I, uh, I've had a public email address since the early 1990s and it hasn't changed. And um Dr. O at craphound dot com for spammers yeah. wishing to send it. Yeah. I mean I got pretty good filtering and practices and stuff. I'm not all that worried about it. But uh, you know, I got an I got a, a DM on the bad place this morning from uh, someone from the Dean campaign days, the Netroots days, saying, there's someone I really want to introduce you to. What's your email address? And I'm like, you've had my email address literally since Howard Dean was running for president. Like, what do you think my email address is? Uh, uh, but, and in that way, you know, it's that thing that, the the as in the beginning of the Lord of the Rings, right? Some things that should not have been lost were forgotten, right? Mm -hmm. And it's not just email addresses. It's the even the possibility that you may be able to directly contact person, somebody without DMing them or going through a social media site or something like that. And I find like that shifting relationship with technology and like what is possible. So par part of the challenge we always have with the decentralized web kind of movement is people being a little bit skeptical that it's going to work right like uh, as a technical I, matter 
uh, as a technical matter and a bit of as a cultural matter, right? So okay. when Mastodon took off um, during the Exodus, right? Um, uh, first of all, someone who I won't mention came up and said, okay, I did one day say to you, stop trying to make Mastodon a thing, Danny, and now it's a thing. Um, but also, <laughs> but also like people's expectations were all over the place. They were like, is this going to be, this is going to be the Twitter killer, right? And this is going to be, you know, this is going to peter out. And I think the correct assessment is it's just kind of, it will be a thing, right? It will, be, that is a natural thing to exist in that space, right? Um, and you're sort of, you're waving your hand. So here's going, what I think. I think, um, I think when we think about growth, that first of all, we have a hard time distinguishing S curves from, uh, from, uh, asymptotic curves, right? From power law curves. So, so it's very, asymptotic very is hard like to, that. an S curve goes like sort of flat up a lot really fast and then sort of flat. Right, right, right. Uh, and, and so, you know, that is the, like, and in fact, there's a version of an S curve. That's the scalloped curve, which is where it goes flat. It grows, dips a bit, goes flat, grows, dips a bit. So you're reaching a new peak every time, and then you have an equilibrium okay. and then a new peak. Right, and, right. and I right. think that, so first of all, when the curve is going up, you can't, there's, there's, unless you have a theory really of like, what's driving the curve up and what are all the forces around it? What's dampening it? It's really hard to know in the moment, like, are you going to go full hockey stick or are you just going to plateau? I mean, of course, everything is going to plateau eventually, right? You just run out of like humans or packets or fiber or atoms or whatever. So like all the, all the curves eventually I have to level off, but it, it's hard to know whether like in, in kind of meaningful time you're in an S curve or an exponential curve. Uh, and, um, then if if it is an S curve or a scalloped curve, it's very hard to predict whether the new equilibrium that you have is such that the next time whatever kind of event dr drives growth, it drives it to you. So think about Mastodon, right? So Mastodon enjoyed a ton of scalloped growth through a series of punctuated crises on Twitter and Facebook. Mm -hmm. Um, and reached I, a I joined it, I joined it in the first Sarah Jong, who also writes very mm -hmm. well about spam. Sarah mm -hmm. Jong wrote a piece going, oh, it's like Twitter without the Nazis before right. Elon Musk or anything like that. And so sure. lots of people. Sure. So yeah. There were a series of these crises. So, so Twitter got a ton of users each time there was a dip and each dip was heralded by the same, like atten goldfish attention span people going, oh, it dipped. So that's done. Right. As right. opposed to like, well, it's dipped to, you know, it was at one. And now it's a, and then it grows to three, and now it's a two. That's good. I actually saw Jeff Bezos give a presentation at Esther Dyson's conference one year, where he was like, "Stock analysts really think Amazon's a turkey because our stock goes crazy. It oscillates. It peaks. It dips. It peaks. It dips." And he put up a, a stock chart, right? And it's just like, blah, 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 right? And then he just put up a chart that was like the day we founded it and today, and it's just this line going like straight up. And he's like, "If you just ignore all the noise in the middle, this is a very good bet. Uh, I mean, this was before he really outed himself as a, you know, monopolist creep, but like he had a really important but, point. But that's right? the transformative. Yeah. That's the transformative thing. I always try and show people videos of Jeff, Be Jeff Bezos being interviewed in the nineties where mm -hmm. people, there's this great clip where the newspaper man's going, this crazy man thinks that we'll be buying books on the internet and I'm going right. to talk to him. And there's Jeff Bezos looking like an utter nerd going, Oh yeah, I guess so. And you know, one of the reasons I show it to people is because people are sometimes like, I won't do anything bad. Oh, I'm just trying right. to do this. And you so, want to go, that's what you look like at the beginning of one yeah, of these Yeah, curves, yeah, yeah. Excellent right? point. Well, right. so I just want to, 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 to finish off this point about scalloped growth. So the next crisis may drive another surge on Mastodon, but there are other places that crisis traffic could go to. So right. the people who are sitting on the bubble on Twitter who are like, I am holding my nose and using Twitter because there's something important to me here. The next time a crisis strikes, are they going to go, I guess it's Mastodon now, or are they going to say, I guess it's Blue Sky now, or are they going to multi-home? And then if they do multi-home, when a month goes by and they've run out of t hours to answer the two social telephones they've committed to answering, which one are they going to hang up? Yeah. And those are all super contingent questions. Uh, and so uh, there is a possibility that Mastodon just uh, levels off. Uh, but there is a possibility that it experiences 
even sharper scalloped growth, right? Like higher peaks uh, before, you know, in, in future crises. Because the one thing, you know, I, I really like, um, there's a thing from finance, Stein's Law, anything that can't go on forever eventually stops. I really like that, right? Twitter, right, right. Twitter can't go on like this, right? So there right. will be a lot, like there is a absolute surplus of crises on our horizon with social media and with other networking services. So a lot of our planning, if we want to transform the way these services get used, should be about what we do when the crisis strikes. We want to have the Patriot Act in a drawer for when 9-11 happens, to, so, to go back to the beginning here. Right, right, right. Which is when we went, when Except we both ended evil. up, when we both <laughs> ended up at EFF, we realized, oh shit, that's what happens, right? Like the day something bad happens, Somebody has been preparing for that moment, and yeah. same with something good happening, right? In my so novel, I, The Lost Cause, I call it. Uh, there, there are all these uh, right wing um, uh, conspiratorialists who call the Green New Deal the Green Shock Doctrine, and and they said, and every because it's set in the climate emergency. Every time there's a new right. wildfire or whatever, stuff happens, and they're like, "Look at these Shock Doctrine people. They're they're doing a Pinochet on us, except to like build sustainable housing and seawalls." So I want to come back to this because this is this is where I feel we are at the in the decentralized web kind of thing at the moment, which is that you is that um, you know there was a time when the existence proof of having a decentralized thing had kind of gone away from people. I would argue with EU journalists uh, when they were talking about um, uh, uh, placing controls on uh, major tech companies, right? Mm -hmm. And I would say, okay, well, think this through. What happens if you try and put controls on major tech companies, um, but you end up sort of stopping a, Euro a, a European big tech company, right? Yeah, yeah. And they would go, what big yeah, European yeah. The tech web company? is cooked. This was the crux of the the thing that I took over from you at, at EFF, which was the fight at the W3C over uh, DRM and browser standards. And the fight was basically like, if we don't put DRM in browser standards, Netflix and the other studios are going to stop releasing to the web and they'll just release to apps. And then that'll be the end of the web because the only thing people want the web for now is streaming video. That was basically the pitch. And, and we said, but if you put DRM in web standards, only companies that have the permission of the then two, now one vendor who makes the DRM are going to be able to make browsers. And the whole point of the W3C is anyone can make a browser by following the reference implementation. Right. And basically the response was, was no one's making any more browsers. The market's cooked, right? Right. We we need to defend the three, you know, the cartel that the, of three companies that make browsers, not maintain the space for new browsers. If we do that, we won't get new browsers because it's, it's just everyone's going to be using apps. Right. So we entered into this situation a few years ago where people were kind of like, well, we just have to try and work out what we're going to do with these big companies. And... Um, uh, now I'm in this weird situation with the D-Web stuff is, is that I, I, we're spoiled for choice. Not in the way that, you, that there's like a, a Goliath killer, but a classic open source decentralized problem of going, there are a million standards, there are a million protocols, right? Tim Berners-Lee has gone off and done, done solid, solid, which is right. Yep. Um, uh, even in the sort of, Twitter clone kind of environment. There's Mastodon, there's Blue Sky, there's you know, a bunch of other ones. Right. <laughs> Gab, if you show. Right. Um, and uh, in the browser space, I was having this really interesting conversation yesterday with the person who's building uh, the Puma browser, which many of you would not have heard of, right? But that's fine because I was saying, like, how many users does you, do you have? And he gave me sort of a figure, which I'm not sure I'm should say but it was like you know that's fine right like that's that's it's not like you know 98 percent of the population but it's enough for you to have like a relationship with a group of people and like develop things on it right the challenge is is like have people really what do people do in that situation where how do how do culturally you transition from a world where Technology is completely um, mapped to big trademarks, to what I sort of describe as like lowercase technologies, right? Early internet was sort of like 
there weren't big trademark terms. There was like email and ILC and the web. I mean, there was AOL and, and CompuServe, but sure, yeah. There, there were, right? But like they sort of, people would seamlessly move between these things. Um, and I don't quite know what that looks like in the modern era, right? Hmm. Um, uh, I, partly because sort of people have more invested, right? One of the things Tim Berners Lee's trying to solve, solve for is like, okay, we put every, we put my satchel of my life in this, mm-hmm. and then I move it around. Mm-hmm. I'm not mm-hmm. uh, like I'm not sure that people are super like. There's a comfort to having these big zaibatsus. Um, uh, you know, you, you, you have this sort of strange relationship with them, um, hmm. the uh, parasocial relationship, like people do have them as totemistic, like Jeff Bezos. And sometimes sure. I'm, mad at I'm Jeff an Bezos. Apple user. So I'm a member of an oppressed ethnic minority. I get, I know. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I mean, so he, I, I, I think that they're like as a first approximation that's true, but there's some really chewy nuance that is missing from that analysis in, in, you know, with all respect and so on. But, <laughs> well, no, uh, I mean, I'm kind I, of like, like, so, yeah. So I think that, um, I, I really have been thinking about discipline on firms that, and projects that provide services to users as being the source of good things on the internet. So things that stop, so everyone is fallible. Everyone gets angry. You and I met at a party from a guy who got angry at me and shut down my server one day because he didn't think I'd said thank you enough and just disappeared Mm -hmm. and never spoke to me again. Mm -hmm. Um, So people get angry. They lose their, they lose their uh, equilibrium. They, um, I got angry in a group chat last week and I'd like to just apologize here. Sure. That was very, people also just, they rationalize their way into bad decisions, right? They're like, I started this project to help people. And I convinced 150 of my friends to quit their jobs to come work with me at this project. And now my investors are saying that if I don't compromise in a way that's going to harm those people and the the people I started the project to help, uh, they're going to fire all those 150 people I hired. And I won't live to fight another day and fix the harm. So I'm going to enact a harm upon all my users in order to live to fight another day and spare the people who really put it all on the line for my vision, right? So that's a like, these are like recurring motifs where people make mistakes. They also like just sometimes are greedy or they quit and then someone bad comes in or, um, you know, the market changes or whatever, right? People, people without discipline without some force that disciplines them, do bad things. Yes, yes, and, right? I think one of those, all of those things happen, even if you are extremely ethical, or even because yeah, you're extremely ethical. Yeah. Right? And also the institutional organization. Like there was a phase where people went, you know, it's corporations that are bad, so I'm going to set up a public... Right, Whatever a public benefit company. Things. I mean, look public at what benefit. just happened with Ello, right? Where they set up a public benefit company right. and then secretly sold the assets of the public benefit <laughs> company to a for-profit. <laughs> right, and same with same with OpenAI, right? Like right. I was in, sure. I don't know whether I've idly boasted about this on the podcast before, but there was, we did a paper, we did a, a, an article which was basically saying about OpenAI you have to share your data. This was when they published the first GPT paper. Mm. And they were like, it's too scary. Like, we have this model, and we're going to show you what it does, but we're not going to share it with anyone. And they were talking through quite seriously like how they would deal with this. And then at some point, they went, you know what we're going to do? We're going to have, we're going to gateway it, gate it with an, AI, uh, uh, an API, and then you have to log in with us, and then you can use it. And half the room were like, oh, yeah, that's smart. So that everyone using it for evil disinformation, you'll see it. And half of us were going, no, that's the poison chalice. Because as soon as you have that control, you are never going to see that It's control. a moral hazard. Yeah. Right? Sure. Right, right, right. Sure. So, so um, I think that there are four constraints that act on firms and, and more broadly projects, but especially firms. So the first one, obviously, is competition, right? People, if, if, if being bad to someone means that they go to someone else and you stop making money from them, that is a thing that can stay your hand. Can, can I just generalize this out? Because I know you said it firms, but like because so many of people in the decentralized web community have all of these different ways of thinking about organizing, 
I've, mm-hmm. uh, you know, well, that's why I said projects too. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But sure. I, I, and the, I just, the other thing I don't about want these people cons- to think that this is something that happens just about to other com- for profit them, entities. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The other thing about these constraints is that they are also okay. all remedies, right? So right. if competition fails to constrain the worst impulse of someone within a firm or a project then the people who are harmed by it get to go somewhere else. Right. So it is both a constraint and a remedy, right? So th- the second constraint is, is regulation, right? The, the um, expectation that the funds that you will derive from cheating are less than the funds that you will be charged for cheating, right? right. And that and do whatever time value money discounting you want. We're going to make a billion dollars today. We're going to get fined $3 billion in 10 years. By that point, I will have retired. And so right. it doesn't matter, right? But whatever, there's some... There's some uh, you know minatory effect. It's a it's a it's a deterrent, right? This the the regulation. The third one, and th- and those two are just generalizable, not just to for profit and you know nonprofit projects, yeah, but also tech talent. and not tech. Right. This is right. yeah, this is true of like you know companies that make popcorn or shoes right. or like not run murdering dangers. people in the right. pursuit yeah, of whatever. something good. Yeah. Right. yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, but then there's two very tech related constraints. So the first one, I've been calling it self help with a nerdy audience. You can call it adversarial interoperability, right? And so, like the kind of um, short version of that is. Uh, uh, all right, uh, time for the weekly product meeting. Uh, I know we've all got these KPIs to hit. We all need to boost revenue. I've done the calculations, and I think we make the ads 25% more obnoxious. We boost gross revenues by 2%. No brainer, right? Everybody gets a six figure bonus. Someone at the table goes, wait a second. I've done some user research. You make those ads 25% more obnoxious, and 25% of our users are going to type into a search engine, how do I block the ads? And then our expected revenue from that user, it doesn't stay static at 100% of current levels. It goes to zero forever, right? The minute you make someone so irritated that they type into a search box, how do I make this go away? Where's the alternative client for Facebook? Then we lose all revenue from that person forever. And then the fourth one is workers. Because historically, tech workers enjoyed an enormous amount of bargaining power, even though they weren't unionized, terrible union density. But um, you could always get a job somewhere else. And that meant that that it's this very curious kind of ethnographic phenomenon where you could quit, so your boss treats you well, but your boss treats you well in this highly specific way where they make like a kindergarten for you with like a gym and like gourmet snacks and massages. And, And then they tell you you're on a mission and you work every hour that God sends and you don't go to the dentist or the doctor. You miss your kid's little league game. You miss your mother's funeral and you ship because you're on a mission, right? So um, that means that when your boss says, hey, Danny, it's time for you to unshittify the app that you built for us, you feel this profound sense of moral injury, right? I did not miss my my mother's funeral to eke out three basis points by putting Burger King logos all over this goddamn Google map, right? Right. And you you, you say, I won't do it, and you quit. And if you do quit, they can't find someone else. So all of those constraints are gone. This is all by way of saying all of those constraints are gone. So um, competition, we allowed merger to monopoly. You have companies like Google that have made one in-house product and then bought everything else. Right. Sorry, go ahead. No, 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 no. I'm just suddenly, my my eyes are lighting up as I realize where you're going. Second, when you drop the number of firms in a sector to five, they capture their regulators, right? right? So we met around the time of the Napster Wars. During the Napster Wars, you had tech, which was 10 to 100 times bigger than entertainment, but it was also 100 companies and not seven. So you had seven right. entertainment companies that said the same thing to every judge, regulator, and lawmaker. You had 100 tech companies that couldn't agree on where to eat lunch. And so they just like, there was no message discipline. They got their asses kicked, right? So you got regulatory capture. So they don't fear regulation anymore. Yeah, we're violating privacy law, but we did it with an app, so it's not a violation. Yes, we're violating labor law, but we did it with an app, but it's not a violation. Yes, we're vi- violating in consumer law, blah, blah, blah. The corollary of regulatory capture is not just that you don't have to obey the regulation, it's that you can make everyone else obey regulations. Yeah. So that's uh, the broad prohibition on adversarial interoperability, Section 1201 of the DMCA, the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, trademark, copyright, tortious interference, trade secrecy, non-disclosure, non-compete, the whole like ball of wax, IP. The 200 Freeman, horsemen of the apocalypse, right? Yeah, yeah. What, what Jay Freeman calls felony contempt of business model, where it's right. literally a felony to displease your shareholders. And so 
the the minatory effect of self help goes away, and then finally you have like Google laying off twelve thousand workers two months after doing a stock buyback that would have paid their wages for twenty seven years. And when someone says, "I'm not putting Burger King ads on this Google map," they're like, "Well, turn in your badge and don't let the door hit you in the ass on the way out, right? We just laid off two hundred sixty thousand of you motherfuckers. We'll just hire someone else to put the Burger King ads on the app. Yeah. It's fine." I yeah. forgot to ask if I could swear on the podcast. You fucking can't. But don't worry. All right. <laughs> so, um, so my point is that if you want to build a new social network or a new thing, historically, the thing that was tech superpower was that self-help side and the competition side. So the self-help side said that if you were if if you had customers who were super invested in silicon graphics, right? And you were Sun Microsystems. So you had the world's sexiest workstations and you were, had the world's beigest workstations, like squarest, beigest, you most You should look it up, people who are watching yeah. this. They, just, they, just, they, yeah. they were pretty, they were, they were purplish. Anyway, yeah. Well, ahead. there were all kinds of colors and they were like, they had basically come along at a moment in which there was a step change in injection molding. And it's like, oh, our cases don't have to be rectangles anymore. Our cases are now going to be every shape that God <laughs> sent, right? Like they were, they were super dope. So, um, you know, if your son and all, and you want to steal customers from SGI, you say to them, like, here's the app that moves your data over. Here's the runtime that runs your code. Here's the reverse engineered interoperable whatever, right? So that, yeah, you've got like your ethnic identity as an SGI user and SGI users are the Mac users of Unix, right? Um, but you, then you need to get something done. Money talks. That's the pull walks. quote, by the way, Joe. Anyway, can, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so um, then you've got to, then you've got to get, you know, you've got to, you, 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 you need to get something done and, and Sun can do it for you. Right, you got to do something big and powerful, uh, and you just you need a lot of flops, and they're cheaper from Sun than they are from SGI, and so you just buy some Sun workstations, and they just work, right? You just like make it work in the same way that like so I, a story I tell a lot that you can probably relate to because uh, it deals with the time around the time we met in the late '90s. I was a CIO for hire. Uh, and I did a lot of integrations and stuff and, um, we would have these shops that would be all PC except for like the designer and the CEO and the designer would have a quadra that ran graphic stuff or a power PC and the CEO would have a power book and, um, Microsoft office was the most cursed piece of software Microsoft had ever made. If you were running it on a Mac, yeah. all you had to do is like wave the installation floppy around and, and like docs would would go corrupt you would right. send the designer a doc and when they opened it no one else could open it ever again and so i started to put dedicated workstations on the desks of my mac users just to read word files and then it was like oh this is stupid so you put a big graphics card and you buy adobe and quark you throw away the mac how did apple solve that they came up with iwork right pages numbers and keynote that can read and write office files word powerpoint excel and then the like, there was just no switching costs, right? You could just go from being a PC user to being a Mac, go from being a Mac user to being a PC. It was all really easy. The thing that breaks my heart about the D-Web projects is that their theory, often their theory of how they uh, um, get big, to go back to like whatever that browser was, right? The theory of how you get people to switch from one to the other is just that you'll convince them that it's better. and. The point is that it doesn't have to just be better. It has to be so much better that it's worth all the switching costs you endure when you leave the last thing behind. Mm -hmm. That's why people are still on Twitter, right? Mm -hmm. It's not because Twitter isn't bad. It's because the people they love who are there are better than Twitter is bad. Uh, it's, you know, I, 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 I use the analogy of Fiddler on the Roof, right? Where like the people of Anatevka just hang out in this village forever, even though the Cossacks ride through every 15 minutes and just kick six kinds of shit out of them. And it's not until they're actually evicted that they leave and you find out why. Because the final melancholic scene of Fiddler on the Roof is everybody leaving and saying where they're going and basically acknowledging that they're never going to see each other again. Right. You know, I'm going to Krakow, you're going to Chicago, he's going to New York. Uh, and um, and that force, right? The force of the people you love and ma who matter to you is much is a much stronger bond than not 
being in the Nazi bar or not, you know, being in the mud village that the Cossacks ride through every 15 minutes. So this is sort of what I mean about like, how do we flip between these steady states, right? And um, so, okay, so one question you casually throw, I mentioned life hacking, you mentioned inchitification, congratulations in being in the Thank dictionary. You. Um, uh, not I, in the dictionary. Word of the word of the year. No one's put it I in know, the dictionary. Everybody yet. thinks it's in the dictionary. That's yeah, it's, and I, everyone also thinks it's the American Dialectical Society, which is like they're not Marxists; they're linguists. <laughs> it's the Dialect Society, <laughs> not dialectical dialect. But you know, it's a thin line. So, um, uh, uh, yeah, cultural so, Marxism has so, taken over the linguistics department. Uh, so, so when you. Uh, there was a really interesting thing that you you said recently, which you said, you know, when I was younger, I was very interested in how things work. Right. And now I'm much more interested in how things break and fail. Fail. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, you know, this is one of those things that like things persist um, until the, until they fail, right? But right. the, the things that, that you see around you, eventually stops. Yeah, right. Are things that have simply not failed yet, right? And yeah. that makes that's a better under gives you a better understanding of where we are as uh, and the technology that we end up with. Um, so I guess one of my questions is is and this is the classic problem of coining a term. Like I think in has in shittification the definition in your head persisted with the term itself, right? Is are people using it correctly? I know you can't I, determine I, that. So but. I am, I literally, before we got on this call, I was packing a suitcase to go to Berlin to do this very prestigious talk. I'm going to do the McLuhan lecture at the Canadian embassy. The incisification. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, and um, of course, German has a language academy that tells you which words, whether you're using words right and when you're not. Right. And the, I've got a joke in German that I have to practice again because the word is very hard. It's one of these German compound nouns, the language academy. The name of the language academy is a compound noun. But basically, I the, I start off the talk by saying I coined this term in shittification. Uh, people use it very uh, loosely to just mean things getting worse. Um, that's fine with me. I am an English speaker. I have no shame and I have no pride and we have no, we have no language Academy. Yeah. Go nuts. And I looked up the German phrase for my dudes. So I say, go nuts, my dudes in German. Uh, and, uh, Reddit has got the best threads. So, um, I, I, uh, I'm okay with this, right? Unlike say, uh, so I know that like, for example, Shoshana Zuboff gets really angry about people using surveillance capitalism loosely, which is funny because I think most people use surveillance capitalism loosely. I think very few people understand what she means by it. And I think many people mean the opposite, right? So she said what she means when she says surveillance capitalism is capitalism is great, but when you add surveillance to it, it gets bad. And I think everybody else is like, capitalism is terrible and always leads to surveillance, right? They use yeah. it in the opposite way to her. Yeah. I'm okay with it. It's a living, you know, it, I speak a living language, which is why it's so, which is why everybody else speaks it. So my question is, is like, you've sort of described the scenario where we pull out all of these things from technology and things get worse, right? If we don't have these, these constraints or these yes. releases on it. Um, and so, and, but, and one other small point, which is that also because technology is very flexible, Right. Um, firms are able to make things bad in very dynamic ways that are hard to resist or stop, not right. in a mind control way, but like if you're trying to figure out whether you're getting the best price, if the prices is if the prices are changing minutely from second to second, it's right. really hard to know. And if the algorithm is watching going, oh, well, you stop buying so much and it gives you a better price or a higher wage. Right. Uh, and then, and then once you're back in it, and not paying attention anymore, it starts to tighter your wage down again. That's like, those are, those are distinctive technical characteristics. And then the remedies, because tech is digital, we have these adversarial interoperability remedies that aren't there. So that it's not just that the firms lose their constraints. It's also that they have these technical means and that there are technical means for addressing them. That's the right. full incentivization pack. Right. Right. So, so. I, I guess there's this. I always fight between kind of the optimism and the and the depression pol poles, right? And you always have to steer this way. And I think people look at incentivization and they go, "Oh, this is the way. So everything's just going to get worse, right?" And the way you're describing it is like, actually, we had to get into a particularly 
meta stable position for it to get for, for 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 everything to get worse in this particular direction do you think that that it do we have to fix all of those problems? Do we uh -huh. create another set of systems that can get around that, right? Um, so what what I think is we solve it iteratively. Right. And the cool thing about um, a problem that is uh, has multiple valences or like is caused by the removal of multiple constraints is that if you run out of, of ability to change one thing, you can move on to change something right. else. So this is a bit like Larry Lessig's idea of there being four forces, code law, norms, and markets, where you know if you if you if there is no software that will fix what you want to do, maybe a law can. And if there's no law that can fix what you want to do, maybe normatively convincing people that forcing the other parents on your kid's little league team to use Facebook to organize the carpool is like smoking in the car while you're on the carpool. It's just normatively right. like not done. It's a gross thing to ask other parents to do. And if norms don't work, then, you know, maybe, uh, you know, we can do it with, um, by starting a business, right? So you can do it with markets. So like, or by, by putting someone out of business, right? So like there's, there's, the as someone who's a very bad driver with poor spatial sense and struggles to parallel park who does a lot of inching back and forth i know that when you run out of room this way like maybe you can solve it by turning the wheel <laughs> Just, all the way that way and going that right. way and it's, you only get an inch but then that inch is the inch you need to to swing the car in okay so I i'm have... no shape rotator i've just outed myself as a word cell well so here's the thing right is that um i think so when, when uh, going back to the sort of like monitoring you to write the life hacking thing, like one thing that you, and in the thread that you posted today, you talk about is, you know, you don't have an assistant, right? You mm -hmm. lovingly craft your audio books <laughs> yourself, partly because- I Gnaw them out of a whole log with my teeth. Right. Because Amazon isn't going to do, is basically boycotting you because you don't want to- DRM. Time to their DRM. But anyway, you do a lot. Right, and and part of the reason for that is because um, what does that bubble mean? I don't know. Um, that uh, oh, the, you've got uh, you've got a Snapchat camera on. Oh, uh, posing my my soon to be sixteen year old has this, oh. and certain gestures trigger the little ML things to do things like uh, make balloons pop up. Or now, now I feel. Up. Now I feel like that guy who has like the the, the lawyer. I'm not who's a, a cat. I'm not, I'm, not a, I'm not a Snapchat. Anyway, Your okay. Honor, I'm not a cat. <laughs> so my point my point here is um, before the ML interrupted that you, you 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 use technology in this way that I think a lot of the sort of mythos of the personal computer um, that I buy into too, right? Which is like having this general purpose computer enables me to execute on a lot of different things and maintain a kind of control over it, right? Like I'm not ceding this to Jeff Bezos or somewhere else because I am the, the master or the mistress of, of my destiny, right? Technological self-determination. Right, right. Now, uh, that's like the kind of Heinleinian dream, right? Right, where you you know you can you can tie the hog. <laughs> Except I'm not married to a redhead, and we're not polyamorous. I I I, I wouldn't presume. Um, <laughs> that that makes it that makes it non Heinleinian. That makes it okay. <laughs> so, it's, it's, but is that like? <laughs> I feel like, and sometimes when I'm talking to people in the D-Web community, they feel they have to do everything themselves, right? They mm -hmm. don't, they have to not only um, solve all these problems, but they have to do it with norms, law, technology, and everything else, right? Like, the, the, it's very hard to know how to coordinate in a decentralized mm -hmm. space. Like, how do you... That, can you unionize? Like, how do you, and uh, I'm speaking to you partly as a writer here and partly as an activist, right? Mm -hmm. Because those are, you know, one of the journeys that you have to take a lot of people on as a writer is for everyone to buy into the story. And it's kind of the mm -hmm. true of activism. So what is the, how do we coordinate to overcome all of these problems, given that the number one power that these 
companies have is the same one as you described for the entertainment industry versus technology in the in the right. In the they're good old days, they're in a cartel. Right? Yeah. So I. I I'm not an optimist, uh, and I actually dislike optimism. I um, I think optimism is a form of fatalism. It's like pessimism, right? Optimism for me is the idea that things get better no matter what we do, uh, whereas hope is the idea that if we make some material improvement to our circumstances, that we can ascend a gradient towards a better circumstance and that from that new vantage point we might see other paths that were obscured when we were lower down on the curve and so i um i am much more of a hill climber than a mapper right the 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 terrain that we need to traverse is too complicated to enumerate it all uh, and by and because it's also dynamic and even uh, adversarial, hostile. If we were to if we were to enumerate it all and find the optimum route through it, uh, by the time we were done, it not only would have changed because of changing circumstances, but the people who don't want it to, to don't want us to get to where we want to go would have changed it deliberately to block right. us. And so, what we need are heuristics, not uh, plans. Because we, and that's how you coordinate big loose groups of people, is you just say like 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 a um, cellular automata or a flock of geese that are keeping formation, right? You just have rules of thumb. If you see yeah. other people doing this, do do it to like back their play, do what they're doing, understand, you know, agree Stay a vision. Stay to the left of right? this person. Yeah, 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 yeah. Agree a vision, like agree, you know, a, a rallying point. Know what you want to do, but um, don't try and tightly coordinate. Be small pieces loosely joined. And, um, I think that, uh, restoring the constraints on firms is doing those four things backwards, right? So restoring competition by prohibiting, uh, predatory pricing, by prohibiting predatory acquisitions, um, restoring regulation and building regulation that is administratable. So this is a, a real problem with a lot of the rules that we come up with when we say, oh, well, this will give big tech a black eye, is they're really hard to enforce. Like leaving aside the question of whether they are co compliance moats, right? They would stop someone from entering the market. Even if you say, okay, well, we're just going to apply this to firms that have over 100 million users or whatever. So that's not going to stop anyone from entering the market. Um, you still have... Uh, like the figuring out whether they're cheating problem, right? So this is why I was right. always really skeptical of do not track because like I send a bit to you that says, don't log this visit. And then how do I find out whether you logged it, right? Like how does the regulator find out whether you've logged it? They go I, do like a colonoscopy on your infrastructure, you know? I thought it was very interesting because uh, um, as we record this, Apple have just published their response to the, the DSA. Um, yeah. And the world is divided between people going this the EU is not going to stand for this. And people going, actually, this feels like a negotiation, right? This feels like right. the EU and and um, and Apple have, have decided on this. The question is, is whether that negotiation is what you actually want or whether you have to climb the hill a little bit more and like get what you, right. get what you actually wanted from it. And so this is a really interesting point. So to, to pull on both of our four factors, right? The four constraints and Larry Lessig's four forces. So one of the reasons that Apple, uh, so I had a heads up from someone in the EU that this was going to be Apple's response. There was, there was, it, it's not just Apple's response. It's actually all the tech companies are going to do the same thing. Right. They've, they've coordinated a response. Um, and it's, it's clearly, it's not to call it malicious compliance is to give it too much credit. It's non-compliance. It's a lot like GDPR where they just, like the GDPR said like, you can't punish people for opting out and you can't just bombard them with consent dialogues. Right, you've got to like, and, and well, how much they is just bombard? did bombard? Like maybe four, right? Yeah, yeah. Right. Well, then they and then they had like these surreal things. Well, it's like, well, we're not seeking consent. Like we weren't, we're not going to seek consent to spy on you because it's a it's a legitimate purpose, right? The legitimate purpose is spying on you, and so therefore I don't need your consent to spy on you because that's legitimate. Why is it legitimate? Because I make billions of dollars from it, and um, the the so you can see where this is going, right? You can see how it's playing out. So. 
it behooves us to ask why did the why was GDPR compliance so bad? It's finally getting a little better, but why did it take? It's now eight or nine years for for the GDPR to be enforced, and the answer, in short, is that you know Ireland is a crime haven, right? It, 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 you have European federalism. Ireland says if you are a company that is large and nimble enough that you can fly a flag of convenience, fly our flag of convenience, and we won't make you pay tax. And then all of the companies that they attract are like, by the way, I don't know if you've noticed this, but we are nimble enough that we can fly any country's flag of convenience. And right over there is Malta, Luxembourg, Cyprus, and sometimes the Netherlands. And if you start enforcing the privacy law, we might become a Maltese company. Right. And so uh, w- th- once you lie down with dogs, you wake up with fleas. So once Ireland says we are going to be a tax haven, they necessarily become a crime haven. And there are, this is like a federalism problem. Like America has this problem with onshore, offshore, with South Dakota and Delaware and so on. America is much more advanced as a federation than Europe, right? It's like 190 years older than the European Federation, whatever, however many years it is. Um, and so it, it's, uh, there's a much there are much more clearly delineated lines between state authority and federal authority in Europe with the DSA and the DMA. The way that they're trying to address this is they're just saying, okay, well, if you want your first protocol, can be the federal court. So they're just saying, like, I don't care if the company that wronged you is headquartered in Ireland, you can sue them in the in the European court, right? Well, that sounds cool, right? Maybe it would work. I have a an intuition that broadly speaking, it's harder to corrupt the federal court. Than the, than the Irish court. However, as someone from Canada, where we've had multiple constitutional crises, Canada's the federation that's sort of dead between the US and the EU in terms of its maturity, and in terms of the extent to which people living in different provinces think of themselves as belonging to different nations. Right. So, so Europeans really feel like they're in different nations. Most Americans don't feel like they're in different nations. Canadians are sort of meh. And in Canada, it's a lot less meh. I mean, Quebec, it's a lot less meh. Qu- Quebec nearly seceded multiple times in my life we had we had uh referenda that were within a couple of points of quebec leaving like making making scottish exit look like um like a distant uh impossibility right yeah you you linked to a 70s 1974 article in the uh, uh magazine going what would it be like in 2024 and one right. of the top predictions was well canada is obviously gonna like yeah canada will apart. have fractured <laughs> will, will ontario be part of america or will it make right. will it stand on its own once quebec leaves right uh so th- this is um so this is all a bunch of like political stuff right so now we're in lesigian law territory right but you can imagine technological things that make the compliance easier, um, in, that might work in, in tandem with the law. So you might say, okay, well, these companies are going to cheat. They always cheat. They're pathologically incapable of not cheating. They're arrogant. They're And more than being arrogant, like there's just so much money that why wouldn't you cheat, right? Like if someone says, okay, you're getting $100 billion a year from this market. And if you cheat, you get to keep $100 billion. And if you don't cheat, you only get to keep $7 billion. Right, of course you're going to cheat and take your chances. Maybe you can wait long enough. You know, IBM wrote out the U.S. antitrust lawsuit. They spent more than the U.S. government every year for 12 consecutive years. They called it uh, antitrust Vietnam. Right? They spent more on lawyers than the entire Department of Justice. They started in 1970. They ended in 1982 when the Reagan administration dropped the case. So maybe you just cheat. And then you f- you take your lumps, you spend more on lawyers in the entire EU, you do it for 12 years, and you walk away with $100 billion a year business. So when they cheat, what do we do? Well, one of the things we could do as a, as a cheating thing is we could have in our back pocket a technological plan where we say, when you cheat, the remedy is you get a special master. And the special master decides who you can sue and whether or not your lawsuits are bona fide or whether they're pretextual to block competitors. And so then we say, okay... Go nuts, my dudes. Make interoperable technology. Reverse engineer this stuff. Make bots. Make scrapers. Make alternative clients. Make bridges. Make gateways. Uh, and um, make your case to the special master that when they sue you for violating their IP, that what they're doing is actually frustrating the pro-competitive ends of the DSA, which they have already cheated on. And and so, like, there's a, by, you know, 
nerds, nerds and lawyers working together. Yeah. yeah. So the historical side note that people probably don't know is that when Microsoft was being uh, uh, prosecuted successfully to for being a monopolist, um, and that's why people of a certain age are still super mad at Microsoft, um, uh, the special- That Clippy. Yeah. The, <laughs> the special um, master- was going to be Larry, Larry Lessig. Lessig. And uh, they went through his emails and found him bitching about like Microsoft software, as anyone would at that point, and got, <laughs> yeah. got, got gone through. Yeah. Okay, so we're-, we're And Microsoft at- also dragged that case out until G.W. Oh, yeah. Bush was elected, who dropped the case. in both cases, you have this interesting moment where all of their attention is focused on one of these four prongs, right? The regulatory prong, the antitrust thing. So they're 100% focused on it. IBM- and Microsoft had the same pattern where they kind of won, right? Like they kind of managed to deflect that. And at the very moment that they won, some technological thing that they hadn't been tracking because the, 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 their attention as an organization just went and chopped the whole thing mm, off, right? I think that's slightly wrong. I think what happens, so like with IBM, you get the PC, right? So the right. PCs are burgeoning. You have the uh, yeah. Altairs, you have the the Apple IIs and stuff. And they can see that market is building, so they're going to build a PC. But they have spent 12 years in antitrust hell where every memo they wrote showed up in court, right? right. And um, they don't want to get back in there. Notwithstanding that Reagan is in the White House, they've just had 12 years of being like dragged over no, a gravel road it. by their ankles from the bumper of the DOJ's pickup truck. Yeah. And so when someone says, let's build a PC... Someone else says, you know, the DOJ really doesn't like it when we do supply chain integration. Use commodity parts, right? They don't yeah. like it when we do software integration, buy an operating system from someone else. Right. And then Tom Jennings over at Phoenix Computing, you know, the guy who started Homocore and Fidonet, he gets hired by Phoenix to reverse engineer the PC ROM. Right. And when when Phoenix starts selling ROMs to Gateway, Compaq, Dell, all these other companies, they're like the DOJ wouldn't like it if we were right. to sue them. This, yeah, I, I see. I see what you're saying. I mean, I think it's the same sort of thing where you end up having you end up with all your resources and relationship in this thing. So you're seeing it constantly, both through this lens, and you're seeing the consequences of what happens if you wander off that. And so that yep. makes you less resilient. Okay. Same with same with Microsoft, right? That's right. why Microsoft didn't do to Google what they did to Netscape. Is right. they just like when Bill Gates in 2019, Kara Swisher asked Bill Gates why they didn't buy Android when they had the chance. And Gates said oh, we were distracted by the antitrust. It was right. eight years after the antitrust ended. Right, right. Right. What he meant was not we were distracted by the antitrust. He meant that we were we, we scarred. Were, we did not to really traumatized yeah. by the antitrust. Yeah. Right. We didn't dare do it because of the antitrust. Okay. So I want to we 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 vaguely loosely keep this to an hour, but I really want to pull right. into something because. Um, we talked about initiativeization. We talked about how people with the best interests, right, um, and goals can end up basically sacrificing mm-hmm. or losing their way or whatever. I feel like I try and work out how to say this to people in the D web community, right? Where like you have to build something in because you are full of righteousness right now, but righteousness does not get you where you yeah. you want to be you're talking and about a ulysses pact so so that's like i think of it as a pre-commitment right i the the number one yeah. thing i think of is tor right where tor yeah. tried to engineer into the early designs of tor the the people running tor couldn't do the obvious thing that someone running tor would 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 would, would be able to do in any other system and it's not perfect right mm-hmm. but i think it, it guided not only tor through not doing that sort of thing but fended a lot off a lot of the suspicion people had people are still right. suspicious of tor which is an anonymizing browser and they go well you know it's secretly funded by the office of or whatever intelligence and, and right right and the the response is like Yes, but that, but even if that was the case, these are the things that the way it's designed would mean that they wouldn't be able to do everything that you, you expect them to do. Yeah. Is there something that people can build institutionally, culturally, regulatorily, into technologically, technologically yeah. into what we're building now that means a, the decentralized web doesn't re, re-centralize or doesn't end up being something worse? Well, so the... the We've seen, you know, we we talked about how Elo was a public benefit company, and then 
transferred its assets to a for-profit. Right. Uh, you know, in Canada, the Mountain Equipment Co-op, which is a, a consumer co-op, not a worker co-op, but it's the equivalent of REI, one of the most beloved Canadian companies, uh, got taken over by a hedge fund that packed the board uh, and basically went private, like shut down the co-op. So there, there are lots of ways that it can go wrong, even when you have those structures. But Ulysses Pacts, pre-commitments, this is, you know, comes from Ulysses, the hacker, who was sailing into the sea of the sirens and you know the established protocol for hearing the sound, song of the sirens but not jumping into the sea was to um, stuff your ears with wax but then you didn't get to hear their really cool song so instead he had his sailors lash him to the mast so that he could hear them but not be not jump into the sea and you know when you go on a diet you throw away all the oreos and it's not perfect because you can drive to the 7-Eleven, but like you give yourself that moment, you know, more, much more seriously um, in debates over gun control and suicide. One of the things that seems to be well supported in the data is that um, the impulse to kill yourself is uh, short lived and that the harder it is to kill yourself, the larger the chances that you won't, right? Take away people's guns, make them make them uh, plan some elaborate something else. And a lot of people who would have killed themselves otherwise seem to not. Um, source code licensing is a form of Ulysses Pact, right? You, when you, when you uh, permanently GPL your code, it's not re irrevocable. Um, your investors can't make you make it proprietary and your users get a remedy, right? If you do take it proprietary, if you fork it proprietary, they can fork a non-proprietary version of it. And in fact, uh, when we started this, I said I was going to record it with Audacity. I'm actually recording it with Sneedacity, which is a Audacity fork uh, be that was created when Audacity's project managers got, uh, got bumped out by people who said they're going to put analytics in it. And so it's Audacity without the analytics. And, you know, uh, until pretty recently, I was a pretty ardent Ice Weasel user, which is Firefox without the trademark claims. Right. Um, and, and they're just, it's literally the same code, but without the thing, the bad thing, right? It's, it's just, it's like an ad blocker, except it's a trademark blocker or, a, or an analytics blocker. It's just, just another thing. It, it lets you take the pre-feast offer and go a la carte. And you have to imagine that for the people who are making these choices about how the product's going to work, even if they are people of ill will, right? Even if you are succeeded by someone of ill will, or if you have a stroke and become someone of ill will or whatever, um, you will still at least think through the possibility of losing all your users to a fork, right? If, yeah. if you, if you go, if you turn into a wrong -un, and if that's not enough, then your users can go, right? So, so source code licensing is very big. I, yeah. I feel, I feel like some of this is about which order you do things too, right? Mm -hmm. Which is like, if you build, like, if you say, don't worry, we're going to build this skate route later, right? We're yeah. engineering it. So yeah, we'll open it when route. it's done is a way to make sure that you never open it. Because it's when your business is going down the toilet that your investors are like, okay, well, let's figure out how, how much we can sell this for when we liquidate it. And right. that's the exact moment when they're not going to let you open it. Right, right, right. They're, that's the exact moment when they're going to make you close it. Look, I love my publishers. I love Macmillan, but they make me. They made me stop Creative Commons licensing my books in 2017. But they couldn't make me go back and uncreative Commons license the other ones, right? Because they're they're irrevocable license. This is this was a thing people were furious about when CC launched. They said uh, you, people are going to make naive choices. And they won't be able to take them back. It's like yes, but then other people will build things. Right. With the stuff they release, and they won't have the rug pulled out from under them because the right. because the person who made the license decision changed their mind, and you don't even know who they are, and they don't know who all their downstream licensors are. So it's impossible to even know to get notice when the license changes. So I think the conclusion here, particularly in the D web sort of space, is is like if you're federating, federate up front, right? Like like yeah. roll, Do, roll make that irrevocable out first. commitments up front. And, yeah. and so this is one of the interesting things about warrant canaries, for example, is that a warrant canary breaks when you stop doing it. Right. So you, you, if every quarter you publish a list of your surveillance requests and then you don't publish any r report this quarter, the uh, logical assumption for everybody else is to say, uh, okay, something bad is happening there. The, this actually started with Jessamine West, who now runs the Flickr Foundation. Uh, and Jessamine was a librarian when the, um, Patriot Act passed. And one of the things in the Patriot Act were these sneaking people. See, it's all 9 Jessamine runs, uh, Metafilter, right? 
Maybe she runs that too. That sounds possible. Yep. Yeah. I, I, I forget who it passed on to after Matt quit. But right. um, but it all comes back to 9-11. So after the after the Patriot Act passed, um, they had these sneak and peek warrants where they could come in and they could order you to turn over your records and they wouldn't and you would be prohibited from telling anyone that they'd been there. And so Jessamine put up a sign in her library that said the FBI has not been here this week. Watch for this sign to go away. And you know, the the, there are pre-commitments you can make, like these proof of life commitments, right? Where you just, you have to send a message every week. And if you don't send the message, then everybody knows something is wrong. There's a, there's a hypothetical idea from the cypherpunk world called binary transparency. I don't know if anyone's ever uh, produced it, but it's like when everybody who gets a binary for an update, automatically the last version that they have, the one that fetched the update, hashes the new binary and puts the hash on a server or multiple servers all around, maybe in Merkle trees, right? Maybe even in blockchains if you must. Uh, and, um, and then everybody else who has just gotten that update and is wondering whether to click it can go, wait a second, 98% of people got this binary and 2% got that binary. Is there a backdoor going out in this one? Right? So, uh, you know, everybody likes the security of building an auto update without user intervention, but very few people think through the insecurity of an auto update functionality without user intervention, because that's how you get um, uh, updates that are poisoned, right? right? So, if you and, and part of that kind of, I guess one of the things that this having this heuristic, right, is we can move towards that. If you're constantly moving towards getting to that, point of purity so with 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 this it it requires um uh making replicatable builds right like yeah. you build the software and it is always built the same and there's some great projects working on that right now um uh, some of which uh we sort of indirectly support and um and you can get to that stage by thinking about how to commit this to to everyone yeah, and I okay. think this is under theorized. I think that you know we could do more on the institution side. Uh, I know that a lot of people, and, and we haven't even touched on this, but I'm a giant blockchain skeptic, and uh, this is the elephant in the room. That's why we talk haven't about touched this on stuff. it. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. No, no, but 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 uh, but um, the one thing that I th I'm interested in, and that everyone who's a blockchain skeptic, as far as I can tell, is interested in, is DAO style organizations, right. and and both uh, as like interested in the promise and also sharply critical of the incoherence of the idea that like, I'm going to make a blockchain. Uh, I'm going to, I'm going to make a DAO. So I don't have to trust the other people in it. Right. We're going to raise millions and millions of dollars. And then we're going to hand it to some guy to go buy a copy of the, the constitution. That's like, well, if you trust that guy with all the money, why doesn't he just run this whole goddamn thing on his own web server? Right. Why do you need the, the stuff? Right. And so like it, it's, um, you know the 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 safe that is made of impregnable steel on six sides and toilet paper on five sides rather and toilet paper on the sixth is uh, does seem like it's five sixths of the way to having a good safe, but uh, I think that um, it would be interesting to spend more time thinking about oracles and you know trusted third parties and all that other stuff certificate in the transparency and things like that. I will get those yeah. people on. I will promise. Yeah. I will get bring Ben Lorian. Get Ben Lorian and ask him about Solid because he thinks um, he followed all the dependencies on Solid, and it's like there's it's got like a hundred dependencies, and he just went through GitHub on them, and like seventy five of them are abandonware with like multiple CVEs, and he's like, sounds good, but uh, and it's, that was it's several a problem, years ago, right? so I don't it's, know where it's, it's at now. Supply side problems of like how do you build that security in, and I will definitely bring some. Ben is a good one, but also this is like. The reason why, one of the reasons why you get this insecurity in uh, uh, creating decentralized systems over blockchain where the money goes is because we have to firm up and we have to secure everything else, right? And you have mm -hmm. to get everything to the state where you can you can reliably secure it in the way that centralized companies kind of promise that they can um, mm -hmm. and have a lot of resources to try and convince you that and also to try and make and, you feel and less I guess the angry, last thing right? I would say is um, the fallback or rather the, or the foundation that all of this lives on is not trustlessness. It's trust and solidarity, right? That, that like, ultimately there's always going to be 
some unanticipatable circumstance that you cannot armor against except through, and this is hokey, but love, right? Love and trust and people who feel an interpersonal connection and who will stick by their principles even when it hurts them because they care about the principle and they care about the people whose lives are at stake. And that's the that gets exploited by by financiers right. who say you love your employees, so that's why you've got to betray the project. But it's also, you know, I, I we we both know stories from the old internet of the sort of John Postel's era where there was just like a person who just everybody trusted because they were trustworthy and they did the right thing and they did the right thing even though no one was paying them to do it. You know, when when Unix was so the reason Unix is everywhere, the reason SGI and Sun had Unix is because AT&T after their antitrust case or after an earlier antitrust case was not allowed to um, sell software. So they had to they had to they had to give it to other people. So they developed Unix uh, and then they gave it to a bunch of other people to commercialize. So it became a multi-vendor platform. And then the bosses at, at AT&T just hated this. And they didn't want the people who were maintaining Unix to help these other vendors. And so people who worked on Unix outside of Bell Labs would get mysterious phone calls that said, if you go to this park in New Jersey and look behind this rock, you will find a tape with the current patches, right? Because the mission mattered more than the firm, more than yourself, whatever. You you care you cared about and believed in, you know, people people's lives being made better by technology. And so you were going to do what it took, not what your boss wanted them, not what your boss wanted you to do. I think I think there's always a temptation when you're doing these sort of big over studies that, that whether you couch it in terms or not, but like they end up being laws, right? They end up going, well, the, the, this will happen and this will happen, um, like in shitification, right? And like, you know, the payoff is it doesn't actually have to happen this way. Like once you've right. observed that this is happening, once you realize, oh, we're going down this, this route and I don't think we actually want to go down this route. Um, there are all kinds of other strategies that you can deploy to 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 go somewhere else, but you have to have that. You have to have ultimately that kind of intent. Um, can Can I finish this podcast with a science fiction anecdote? Yes. Okay. So Ada Palmer, who I think you probably know, the brilliant historian, uh, librettist, and science fiction writer. Uh, who's a tenured professor of Renaissance history at the University of Chicago, where she teaches about heterodox information, banned information during the Inquisitions in Florence. So witchcraft, homosexuality, political heresy, religious heresy, and so on. She is famous on the University of Chicago campus for an annual LARP in which her undergraduates elect the Medici's Pope. Uh, and so the students are each given the identity of a real cardinal from a real great family or someone else who is an important personage in the wrangle over the Medici's Pope. Uh, and for four weeks, they form alliances, break alliances, stab each other in the back, stick up for each other, do every imaginable thing. And Ada has um, a Google alert for theater companies that are selling off costumes. So she dresses them all up at the end of the thing. And they go into the big pseudo Gothic cathedral on campus. They, they book it out for the day and they elect the Pope. And every year going in, two of the final four candidates are always the same every single year because the great forces of history bear down on that moment to say that these two people are always going to be in the running. Right? No matter what, Apple and Google are always going to have an AI product or whatever. They're always going to be like in contention to capture the next market. But the other two people in the final four have never once been the same because the great forces of history always have room for contingency. Human agency always plays a role in historic outcomes. Indeed, the great forces of history are just another name for human agency the last time around. <laughs> Right. Uh, and um, th the idea that, like, we run on immutable social laws that are like a physics of human behavior or social organization is a council of despair that grossly overdetermines certain frequent but not inevitable outcomes and does so to the exclusion of other possibilities. 
right? That the the belief that things can't be different is an enormous determinant in whether things end up being different. You know, Margaret Thatcher's "There is no alternative" is not an observation; it's a demand. Stop trying to think of alternatives. So I think that you're right that when the when the moment comes, when there's extremists, when the chips are down, you know, it it's not inevitable that things will go a certain way. We have human choices. Contingency exists in every moment. Um, the great forces of history exist too, but they are not inevitabilities. They are merely heavy weights on probabilities. Corey Doctorow, thank you very much. We didn't even do the proper promotional thing. So let me just oh. say you have a million books coming out. I'm really looking forward to the bezel. Um, yes. This is going to be My great. prison tech novel. You'll yeah. like it. Yeah. Um, and uh, you also wrote something for us for in D-Web Digest, which I will do yep. a counter plug for, which is a great piece put together by Mike Masnick. And the URL will probably appear down there or something on it. Um, right. It's going to be great to see what you have coming next. Uh, where do people go Thank for the Kickstarter much. for the Bezel audio book? Uh, well, unless this goes out in the next few days, they'd probably be too late. But oh, it's the, what do you want people to do after that? Buy the Bezel, uh, I guess. Just buy the bezel, yeah. Okay. Uh, buy the bezel or buy buy Red Team Blues. I'm going to be out on tour from February 20th till the end of March, um, in lots of places, mostly on the West Coast, but I'm going to have some East Coast dates too. Uh, and I'll be in, um, uh, I'll be in, um, sorry, Turin and uh, Tartu uh, uh, in the spring as well. So if you're in Estonia or Italy, come out and say hello. Or nearby. Just, just European states that begin with vowels. That's right. all I'm doing this year. That's it. That's Going a to good Berlin, to that's to. Alemannia, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Corey, thanks again. Um, and uh, thanks for listening in. And uh, join us yeah. at the next D-Web Decoded. If you don't.